Drafting Archetypes is sponsored by Grey Viking Games. Check them out at greyvikinggames.com and use our code DRAFT10 for 10% off. Hi everyone, this is Sam Black with Drafting Archetypes, and this week we are going to talk about White Black in Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Big picture, uh, this is like an average power level archetype on 17 lands. It has an overall uh, average win rate or an overall win rate of uh, 54.5 compared to a format average of 55, which puts it right in the middle of the pack in terms of successful archetypes. So it's not something that you really need to avoid or should really pursue. It's just sometimes you end up here. As far as like what's going on with this archetype, it actually is doing what it is advertised to do. Uh, this archetype is about uh, venturing. I've talked before, especially in like Strixhaven, about how some of the like explicit color pair synergies, traps, or like insufficiently supported mechanics, where if you tried to push the theme, it would be weaker than if you just took independently good cards or just like drafted a curve or drafted like generally aggressive cards or generally controlling cards or something. But here, the actual word venture uh, makes a card in black white considerably better than it would be in somewhere else. So, for example, Precipitous Drop is the second best black common in black white, where it is the fifth best black common uh, overall. So, that's just like a single example of like a card that is a lot better when you're doing the venture thing because it gets better when you are completing dungeons and it helps your other venture stuff. And White Black has a bunch of those cards, so it's worth doing. I I jumped right into this. Before I get too far ahead of myself, I do want to uh, be sure and remind everyone I do have notes for this archetype that are posted on Drafting Archetypes. So um, if you want to pull those up and follow along, if you are a limited guru, reminder to do that that out of the way. Let's get back to what I was saying. Sorry for the uh, interlude there that should have been in the beginning. So Venture, yes. In fact, Venture, so yes, that the uh, common with the highest win rate overall from among all of the white and black commons in, well, all the commons in total in uh, this archetype is Veteran Dungeoneer, coming in at a higher win rate than Priest of Ancient Lore in the same color, higher win rate than Grim Bounty, Grim Bounty, higher win rate than Precipitous Drop. Uh, Veteran Dungeoneer is the most successful card in this archetype. Does that mean that like I'm first picking Veteran Dungeoneer over Grim Bounty? Absolutely not, because you know if we're talking about pack one, pick one, then I'm more concerned with like the aggregate performance than the performance in any particular archetype. And Veteran Dungeoneer is not as successful in the format at large as Grim Bounty is. If it's pack three and you open Grim Bounty and Veteran Dungeoneer, it might actually be reasonable to take the the Dungeoneer over the Grim Bounty. Obviously, by the time you're in pack three, you're going to have a lot of context for your deck. You're going to know, do I have a lot of removal? Do I, you know, do I want another value creature or do I want an answer? Am I like using the treasure from Grim Bounty in some useful way? Am I currently long on face reversals and looking for good creatures to return? You have a lot of context, and the cards are similar in power level, so uh, the context could change it. If you don't know where to go with the context, you could really go, you could err either way. You could err toward Dungeoneer because it has the higher win rate, or you could err toward Grim Bounty because, honestly, conventional wisdom is going to say it's the better card. And I I wouldn't really want to tell you that I'm confident that you'd be more successful going one way or another there. Honestly, I feel like a lot of the success that I've had in this format and this format has been like I've been more successful in this format than other formats. I feel like a lot of uh, what's been working for me is honestly just trusting the stats. And like one of the best examples of that is Vampire Spawn, where a lot of people ask me about it and say, like, is this card really as good as it looks? And just kind of don't believe its numbers. Whereas I was just like, its numbers are great and it makes sense to me that it's good. So I'm just going to lean into it. And it's played out wonderfully for me. I have no regrets about just like stats say it's good. I'm going to believe it's good. I'm going to draft it highly. And just broadly in this format, uh, trusting the numbers has worked out well for me. I think that this format is kind of like straightforward in that way, as long as you're careful to contextualize for archetypes and pay attention occasionally to bumping things one way or another for like some explicit synergies and support. But like 
as far as just like broadly applicable cards like vampire spawn if you just take the ones that the numbers say are good rather than the one that maybe something some kind of conventional wisdom that you happen to be listening to says is good that's worked well so i guess let's let's talk a little bit about like the kind of raw power level of grim bounty because honestly four mana sorcery speed removal is something where i feel like its strength varies a lot from um, format to format we've seen like feed the serpent four mana instant speed exile based removal should be a lot better than grim bounty even though grim bounty gives you the treasure uh there's a big difference between instant sorcery speed removal and exiling matters but context is very important this treasure sometimes gets converted into like a full card with Skullport merchant or something or allows you to splash and the nature of this format is such that hard removal is pretty good. That is to say, I'm fairly comfortable at this point in this format, having played a lot of Grim Bounties, discussing Grim Bounty as a really powerful card. But that's not because four mana sorceries being kill a creature, make a treasure is a really powerful card. It's because of the context of the format. Veteran Dungeoneer, four mana, three, four value on ETB. That's actually pretty good also. Like there are a lot of formats where that where it's not surprising that that's like a dominant creature. It's really weird to compare like just what does this creature even do literally? Because the strength of like venture is so weird and contextual where it's just like, okay, well, the actual ability of like the amount of value I get from this ETB trigger changes depending on how quickly and how frequently I'm doing this thing. But, like, broadly, you know, 3-4 creature with an ETB sounds pretty good to me just in general. So anyway, those are both powerful cards, both very successful in this archetype. And I guess that was just a rant about how context matters in Limited, which you should know. Yeah, as mentioned, um, the primary thing that you're looking to adjust in your evaluations of cards, if you're trying to evaluate them yourself rather than just, you know, trusting 17 land stats or whatever, is to uh, emphasize Venture more highly than you would uh, if you were drafting a different archetype. So strategically, uh, what's going on with white-black in in a larger sense is very traditional. This is very much like grindy attrition style white-black where you have a lot of good answers in both your colors. You have like Grim Bounty and uh, Precipitous Drop, but you also have like you hear something on watch. I would generally advise against minimus containment, but it exists if you need it. And then you have uh, these like one-shot value creatures like Veteran Dungeoneer, Priest of Ancient Lore, uh, to some extent Clattering Skeletons. And then you also have these kind of like value over time creatures like Planner Ally and Ranger's Hawk. And you're kind of like, one way or another, you're uh, going to be like grinding incremental advantage, either by playing these ETB creatures or by using these like value over time, you know, planeswalker light type creatures. So because what you're doing is like the longer this game goes, the more random extra resources I generate, either because I draw more cards that like are a card and give me a fraction of a card or that give me a fraction of a card over time. All of that points to you want the game to go longer. So this is like a small game deck in that you want to trade off resources uh, to maximize the impact of the advantage that you're generating that looks to have inevitability in a long game. And that's very often where white-black ends up. You are trying to trade off, you're playing a long game, you're getting some kind of incremental advantage and hoping to just like wear your opponent down. What's unique about its positioning in this format is a product of blue being as weak as it is where both blue in general is weak, which means that it's underplayed, which means that you don't play against blue decks very often, but also aggressive nature of the format and the weak positioning of blue leads to a situation where the few card draw effects that blue has, it actually generally can't afford to play because the tempo hit is so large against the aggro decks that the cards just don't do very well. And what that means is where white-black might sometimes have to worry about a blue deck going over the top of its like little finicky grindy stuff with just like draw four cards or whatever. Here, 
you're not going to run into that very often, which means that it's more likely that you structurally have inevitability over a random opponent than it would be if a uh, card advantage in another archetype, generally in a blue archetype, is stronger than the card advantage that you have. White-black honestly ends up getting to kind of have the strongest card advantage. Now, does that mean you have inevitability over everyone? Well, really in limited, a lot of inevitability comes down to who is drawing to the best rares. And uh, that's still true in this format, unless you have like a genuinely excessive amount of removal and your removal lines up well against whatever rare they might or do have. So it, it's always going to be the case in limited that a lot of inevitability is just going to come down to literally the strength of your deck rather than the strength of your archetype. But structurally, Black White as an archetype is well positioned to have inevitability across the format, assuming equal power level between the two decks. Honestly, that's kind of just like the major hits here on like what's going on with this archetype. I I, I genuinely think it's really simple, really straightforward. Like it it is just about okay, you're you're doing the white black thing. The format is allowing you to do the white black thing. The format such that you can expect that most opponents are going under you. Then the question is just like, okay, so knowing that people are trying to go under me, like, what am I looking for? Like, how do I stop that? How do I get my inevitability? And the answer is what it kind of keeps being, where cards like Vampire Spawn and Shambling Ghast, these like relatively cheap defensive cards that stop Aggro decks from getting under you, are kind of the like non synergy cards that like sneak in because they're so good in the format in terms of just like stopping people from getting under you. So big picture, what that kind of balances out to is immediate value creatures are the like two most important things. Veteran engineer, priest of ancient lore, premium removal, grand bounty, precipitous drop, and then good defensive cards. Well, so vampire spawn, Steadfast Paladin, but actually, like, Fate's Reversal's in there, too. Fate's Reversal, uh, when you're wise, is right ahead of Steadfast Paladin. And that's kind of more in the value space, where, like, it is itself, like, draw one and a half cards for two mana, where you get, like, your creature back, that's, like, one card, and then you get your uh, adventure, that's, like, half a card. Obviously, it's particularly good if it returns strong creature or an ETB creature, like the Veteran Dungeoneer, Priest of Ancient Lore. Like, um, you're, you're very happy if you can go, like, Priest of Ancient Lore, draw a card, trade it with your thing. Fate's Reversal it, play it again, draw a card, trade it with your thing. Like, that's the kind of grinding that you want to be doing. So Vampire Spawn, Fate's Reversal, Steadfast Paladin, you hear something on watch. Like, Vampire Spawn and Steadfast Paladin are both kind of just, like, trade with their early attacker, gain some life, buy some times so that you can use your clattering skeletons, and then ideally your, you know, better, better Dungeoneers to uh, get that guaranteed advantage. And then, like, behind Clattering Skeletons, which is behind you here, something on watch, you have Planner Ally and Ranger's Hawk are weirdly, like, exactly as good. Um, and so those are, like, the main reliable, like, keep keep venturing stuff. And then, like, Yanti Fangblade, like, aspires to keep venturing, but realistically it's likely just going to trade with something most of the time. Dawnbringer Cleric is very much in that, like, vampire spawn steadfast paladin kind of space with a little bit of extra utility. Shambling Ghast and Dawnbringer Cleric are right behind the, like, Ranger's Hawk, Yanti Fangblade type space. We were getting more into the, like, filler nuts and bolts kind of stuff in this archetype with, like, Dawnbringer Cleric, Shambling Ghast, Baleful Beholder, all have, like, identical win rates. Worth noting that this archetype has access to both Dawnbringer Cleric and Baleful Beholder, both of which have, like, this, you know, kill and enchantment feature. Uh, you might want to pay attention to, like, have some of that, don't have too much of that. Obviously, they both have other modes, so it's not the end of the world if, like, you just, like, have a lot of things that might disenchant and usually don't. You know, there, there are diminishing returns on kill and enchantment such that you probably want to, like, you know, have X total of those two cards. And then the other cards, the last three commons that come in at an above average win rate uh, for the archetype are your Ambushed on the Road, Arborea Pegasus, and Hired Hexblade. I think Hired Hexblade is interesting in that obviously it's not very good if you don't have treasure, and this archetype isn't like 
making a lot of treasure, except that every time you go through the mine or whatever, the middle dungeon, you uh, have the option to make a treasure on stage two. So you can always, you know, get your treasure for your Hexblade there if you need to. Wanted to touch briefly on cards that I like, even though they don't have a great win rate in the archetype. Three stood out to me as like, yeah, I get it. This card doesn't win that much here, but I still want to play it sometimes, even though its win rate's a little lower. Those are uh, Spoker Ghoul, which, you know, a lot of what you're trying to do with that is have a reliable sack outlet for Price of Loyalty, which obviously you're not playing in your white-black deck, so it's not a priority. But I really like Shambling Ghast. Like, I'm willing to first pick Shambling Ghast, and so... I'm likely to end up with like two or three shambling gas and basically just like anytime I have enough gas, then ghoul becomes good kind of regardless of what the rest of my deck is doing. And then also this one other kind of cute interaction is if you have ghoul and clattering skeletons, that's like the one way in the format that you can uh, use venture as a combat trick where you sack your clattering skeletons at instant speed to venture to like get a stage that might impact combat right then. So like I've sacrificed clattering skeletons to give a creature that was attacking for lethal minus four power to buy a turn and ghoul enables some of that stuff. I don't, I don't want to play it unless I have multiple shambling ghasts, but that comes up often enough that I'm going to play it in this archetype some portion of the time, even if it's theoretically uh, weaker than some other cards. Delver's torch has a slightly lower win rate. All of the equipment in the format doesn't do very well across the board. Most of it's overrated. Uh, I don't know how much this is because, like, there's a lot of equipment in the format, and it's really easy to have too much of it. And anytime you play too much of it, it's going to cut into your win rate. But any player who doesn't get that and plays too much of it is going to drag down the win rate of all of the equipment. So, like, if one person's playing five pieces of equipment, that's, like, five different cards that, like, they're losing with, but it's still just, like, one person who's losing because they're playing too much of it, whereas, like, if everyone's playing just, like, the first piece of equipment might have a positive win rate. Now, th this is something that maybe some people at 17 lands will decide to dig deeper into. Um, I'm sure they could theoretically look at, like, win rate as a function of number of pieces of equipment in your deck. There, it's a little tricky in terms of like untangling like the win rate of the equipment versus the win rate of like equipment in general. I don't know. I, I think that there's a lot. There are some serious potential confounding factors on the win rate of equipment, specifically the particular cost that is paid when you overload on equipment outside of your like red white Bruner type decks that do want a lot of equipment. But as far as just like I'm playing a normal creature deck. Those kind of decks likely want one or two pieces of equipment. And I could see just like some people categorically overvalue equipment, lower their win rate, lower the value, lower the win rate of equipment. So my experience with and against Delver's Torch has been that it has felt a little bit better than its number suggests in white black in small numbers. Certainly, you know, like I've said, I I do think that it's correct to like offer a lot of deference to the stats and to generally trust them anytime where you can't explain why a number is the way it is, then just maybe trust that it's right. But I do have a theory here to explain why it's low and it, you know, maybe could be higher. So I, I currently still often will attempt to play a Delver's Torch in my white black decks. And then the one other card is very much for the same reason as the Ghoul, and that's Deadly Dispute. Honestly, Deadly Dispute has a pretty bad win rate outside of uh, Red Black specifically, which makes sense to me. It's good as a sack outlet and good with treasure and little stuff to, that you want to sacrifice. Red Black has the red cards that make treasures plus the back black cards that make treasures plus like swarming goblins gives you like a goblin to sacrifice or whatever. So it makes sense that it's quite a bit better in Red Black than in other places, and it is. But, you know, the same situation with Hexblade, where, like, you can't always be guaranteed that you'll make a treasure, and Deadly Dispute gives you value there, and you're a grindy deck, so it seems like you should want a two-mana card draw spell, and, again, like, I often have more Shambling Gasts than the average bear, so Deadly Dispute's going to be a little bit better for me. 
So, and I, I still have been frequently just trusting the stats and cutting deadly dispute from my white black decks, particularly in cases where I end up a little bit low on creatures and wanting, and it, it often comes down to like, well, I need to play this many creatures and I need to play my removal spells and I want to play some card advantage. So I'm either going to play deadly dispute or fate's reversal. And at that point, I generally go for fate's reverse because it is, you know, like 5% higher win rate and makes total sense. But like, it makes total sense that it's a particularly good fit here. But, you know, I'm not off Deadly Dispute in white, black in all cases. I'm, I'm still going to look for spots where I have a lot of treasure and I'm looking for a, for a two mana draw too. I, I think the card is just really good. So that covers the commons. Briefly go over uncommons. Not a, not a whole lot here. There's kind of, you know, I think like maybe multiple people a day, honestly, ask me recently whether I would first pick Power Word Kill or Skullport Merchant. And Power Word Kill does have a higher win rate in the format at large. I think Skullport Merchant has a higher win rate in Red Black specifically still, but uh, Power Word Kill I think is higher everywhere else. I personally am taking Skullport Merchant over Power Word Kill. Pack one, pick one. I've, I've had really good experiences with Skullport Merchant. I think it, I think I play well with it. I think it plays well to my playstyle. I think the other cards that I like to draft are good with it. But it's worth noting that Power Word Kill has like a 5% higher uh, win rate than Skullport Merchant and every other common and uncommon in this format. Uh, Power Word Kill is just like head and shoulders ahead of everything else. It's, you know, we're talking like 63.7% game in hand win rate compared to 55.8. And 55.8, that exact number, is shared by Veteran Dungeoneer and Skullport Merchant. So that that really highlights just how incredible Veteran Dungeoneer is. So when we're talking about like the top white uncommons in Black White, realize that outside of Power Word Kill, none of them are better than Veteran Dungeoneer. Power Word Kill's the top, followed by Skullport Merchant, which is tied with Veteran Dungeoneer. I personally am taking Skullport Merchant over Veteran Dungeoneer 100% of the time, but they, they do have this, you know, theoretically identical win rates. And then White Dragon is kind of like tied with Grim Bounty behind Priest of Ancient Lore. Reaper's Talisman is a little bit behind Grim Bounty and Precipitous Drop, but like ahead of Vampire Spawn. Um, note Grim Bounty and, actually, and Precipitous Drop are actually tied in White Black. And then Dungeon Crawler actually has the same win rate as Reaper's Talisman, and that one's honestly kind of like shocking to me. Dungeon Crawler is fillerish in uh, most of the other archetypes, and I'm not surprised that it's like a lot better in White Black because you're so much better at completing dungeons. But it goes from fillerish to like absolutely premium. Like it, its win rate in White Black is higher than Black Dragon, higher than Warlock class higher than like borrowing like those are those are some really good cards that one's confusing to me like you do you know a, a two one that can block and comes back and you know can trade and often trades up on mana and stuff like it's not surprising to me that it's good but it is surprising to me that it's that good so anyway black dragon warlock class borrowing cloister gargoyle ray of enfeeblement i'm not just naming random cards these are in descending order of win rate Cridal played on the splash ingenious smith cleric class played armor grim wanderer i want to touch on ingenious smith because i've had some experience with it recently where uh, i saw it in a pack that was pretty bad and i was like i don't really know what i'm doing with this in white black and i checked its stats and i saw that its stats were good i drafted it even though it didn't really have any synergy at the time and then it ended up going really well between just like some random equipment and Cloister Gargoyle being an artifact and dungeon map. And like there are some like worse than you want to play cards that you still end up playing some portion of the time if things don't go perfectly. Then like you also have, you know, just like getting a counter anytime you make a treasure and being able to do that when you venture. It ended up, you know becoming 3-3 three, three or 4-4 four, four fairly often and like finding a card kind of surprisingly frequently for me. Like I, I don't expect it to like give me a card up front, but that just like free bonus happened, you know, a, a good portion of the time. So uh, th that card impressed me, you know, rel relative to, I'm not saying it's a bomb or anything, just like relative to low expectations, it played well. That covers the commons and uncommons, and I, I don't like going super deep on rares here. We already talked about the big picture stuff. so. That will cover it for my uh, kind of lectures. 
portion. So let's turn it over to Twitch chat. Uh, I see that they've been saying some stuff that I haven't been reading. If there are any questions, please re-ask them. If you know you haven't asked, obviously still a great time to ask. Um, while I'm waiting to see if any questions are asked, obviously I want to thank my newest patrons, um, Liddy and Alec. Thank you so much for the support. I uh, really appreciate both of you joining the uh, Patreon over at patreon.com slash drafting archetypes. And again, of course, any listeners that are uh, learning a lot from this podcast and interested in supporting it or interested in getting some extra perks, extra insight, access to uh, my personal draft history, as well as notes and stuff like that, I would just encourage you to go to patreon.com slash drafting archetypes and check out uh, what's available and what we have to offer and see if it's something that you want to support. So questions. First, I love the torch in white black and all the equips play really well in it for me. Uh, not sure what 17 land says. Um, so you uh, agree or am I getting lucky? You know, I, I talked about this a little bit in terms of, I think that there are massive diminishing returns on additional pieces of equipment. And it's very easy to, for me to believe that in a creature heavy deck, the first piece of equipment or two uh, go a long way, and it's easy to imagine having success with them, especially Delver's Torch for me. At the same time, this is the kind of thing that's like really hard to speak to from personal experience. You just gather anecdotal data so like slowly, and it's really hard to figure out like, oh, well, you know, twice my opponent plundering barbarian my equipment and I was just down a card or like, oh, I invested a bunch of mana this time and they happened to have like a dragon's fire in response. And then I was behind on tempo and like, you don't know how often that stuff comes up and how much to value it. So it ends up being really, really hard to tell just anecdotally. It, like, I think that it's not at all surprising that an individual player is going to have good experience with equipment. Equipment is powerful. There are a lot of different ways that it can lead to trading up, generating advantage over time. And then I think where you're going to see it's like win rate. Like I, I honestly think plundering barbarian it's by itself um, considerably drops the win rate of every piece of equipment because it's a good card that like you know basically any red deck is going to be happy to play. So very rarely ends up in people's sideboards. It usually ends up in people's decks. And you are considerably, like, it's much worse for you if they kill your equipment, like, if you're down a card than if they make a treasure. It's possible to have, you know, generally positive experiences, but, you know, lose more often because of those times where you just get two for one because you put an artifact in your deck. There are enough confounding factors that I can't, you know, authoritatively tell you if you're right or wrong, if you think equipment is good or bad. Next question, is dungeon selection still 90% middle one? And here, kind of my default algorithm is that my first run, most of the time that I'm white-black, is going to be going through the mine because it finishes quickly and gives me the most upfront advantage kind of like in the early game where it's most likely that things are going to snowball and that like this immediate payout is going to be at a time where I need it where we're kind of like vying for position. And then very importantly, it's also the dungeon that I finish first to get my if you've completed a dungeon bonuses. And then... Once I've completed that, and now I have a better sense of like, okay, how how am I speed running these dungeons? Like, do I have like a Ranger's Hawk and a Delver's Torch or a dungeon map or like something where I know I'm going to be completing like one or two dungeon steps every turn? And there I'll often pivot on my second run into the Mad King or Mage or whoever he is and go through the long dungeon with the high payout. If I'm in a spot where it's like, okay, this game seems like pretty stable, like it's not about to end and I'm going to be doing a lot more venturing or like after the first one, I'll be like, okay, I'm pretty far ahead. I'm like pushing an advantage. I just want to like get some damage in or I want to like get this 4-4 death touch for extra pressure or something like that. So for me, I kind of like most of the time, if, it, if I'm venturing early in the game before the game has really been def differentiated, I'm going to uh, go into the mine for my first run, and then I'm like more likely to pivot for a following run. Next question is just curious about more digging into Dungeon Crawler, because it doesn't seem like it would play well with the archetype as I described it, but its stats are absurd. So, few things there. Um, obviously, like the recursive threat plays really well with Delver's Torch. You know, it doesn't seem like this, you know, 2-1 aggro card 
would play well with this like inevitability based attrition deck. There's some truth to that. On the other hand, this isn't purely an aggro card, right? Like this isn't it's a zombie that can return from your graveyard for a black if you have another zombie and can't block. This can block, and so it plays defensively and trades with your opponents like small attacker and you know, like so many all of the aggro decks are playing like two twos for two. And so being able to trade your one drop with their two drop uh helps buy time. And then uh getting the threat back and trading again. Once I'm talking about, oh, your deck is about playing a small game, that's where it's like, oh yeah, of course a two one, like an extra threat that comes back and trades off. That's a perfect small game card. It might not seem like, oh, this is a control card. This is about inevitability, but it is definitely a card that plays well in small games. So as far as just like trying to slot in your head, like how does it make sense that I want this like recursive two one in like a control deck, you're an attrition deck that's looking to answer all of their stuff and find some kind of like, you know, value over time to grind someone out with. And like a 2-1 that comes back uh, plays better in a small game than a large game. If you have like removal for, for all of their creatures that are big enough that it can't trade with them, and then their little creatures end up needing to trade with it one way or another. Next question, are there any rares that you most want to splash in this archetype? I'm not going to ignore that question, but I'm going to uh, take inspiration from it to answer a different question. It basically, like, the answer is, well, I want to splash any busted rare that costs a single color mana. You know, like, I'm happy to splash Drist or whatever. Rather than trying to, like, list all of the, like, busted cards I could splash, I want to talk about just, like, how good is splashing in this archetype? And mostly that is to say I want to comment on the fact that this archetype is pretty good at splashing because you have both, like, treasure creation from black and the fact that you can always choose to create a treasure when you venture your second time. This archetype is basically guaranteed to venture twice throughout the course of a game, which means that you can like basically guarantee that you're going to get a treasure, which means that you can guarantee that you're going to get a mana of any color, which means that if you're splashing a single off-color card, you can be sure that you'll be able to cast it. I do think that this deck splashes powerful rares well, as long as they're rares that you are trying to cast on turn you know five rather than on turn two because like obviously you're just not going to adventure twice on turn two next question do you think splashing hamapashar is a trap what about the green uncommon ventures i'm gonna go with the stats lead me to believe that it is a trap in that hamapashar's stats specifically are just unbelievably bad and then the green uncommon ventures I could imagine it, but by default, I I don't think so. Um, they certainly, like, you know, Crydel appeared higher on the win rates than those cards did. I didn't, like, dig deep into them specifically, but I, I didn't see anything that would point to that's something that you do want to do when I was looking for, like, hey, what do the stats say you want to do here? Which leads me to assume that it's not something you want to do. But... If you're, you know, particularly high in treasures or you're planning to splash a green card anyway, and so you have like Evolving Wilds in a forest or whatever, I, I don't think it's like bad if you end up with like um, the Troubadour in your deck or something. Next question. In White Black, I feel like I'm most confused about how to decide which dungeon to prioritize to complete, whether I should be trying to grind through the short dungeon fast to get the dungeon completion bonus early or not. I'm going to hope that this was asked before I went into that. I, I hope that I've kind of covered what I consider to be the like default dungeon algorithm. Is this an archetype that, you act, that you're actively interested in getting into an average black or white start to a draft? Does it take something special like Nadar to make me want to be black or white? So my answer personally for this is that where I am in this format right now, if, if I'm playing to win, is that I have a very strong preference for black. I acknowledge that like statistically black and red are at roughly equal power levels, but I just really like the black cards and the black play patterns, and um, I just enjoy playing the kind of game that the black cards in this format play, whereas the red cards play a game that's much less in my comfort zone. I kind of like almost draft as if like black cards are colorless. Like I just expect every draft I'm going to end up black and another thing, which leads to being black white anytime I have like some really good white cards or whites open or whatever, so, which means that the bar for me is lower than the bar probably should be. Like, for example, red-white has a higher win rate than black-white, and 
Red is a great color. There's no reason you should avoid red. At the same time, I don't know if I've drafted red white yet because neither of those colors are black. And so it's just unlikely that I end up there given how I'm prioritizing things at the moment. I don't think that it's unreasonable to value black the way that I do. I also don't think that it's unreasonable to prioritize red over black all in sequel when you're just like, should I take this good red card, this good black card, pack one, pick one? Like, do I take a Grim Bounty or Dragon's Fire or whatever? My, my kind of like broader answer to that is anytime you're looking to play a long game, like I, I, I talked about how you know, structurally black white is advantage in a long game, but that's very easily trumped by your opponent having a better deck than you. So anytime you don't have bombs and you're going into this, oh, I'll play a long game space, you are opening up a potential weakness where your opponent just has a stronger deck than you and you're playing into their game plan of drawing their rare eventually. And so it is dangerous to go into any sort of you know, long game controlling attrition type deck without bombs. And so if I were to make the case against having a low barrier to entry in uh, drafting white black, that's what I would say is, well, you're setting yourself up to have to play against your opponent's best cards. So if you don't have cards to let you hang, you're probably going to be in a bad position, which is to say, I do think theoretically you want to have something, something powerful to go into this. But I've been okay just like having some removal for those cards. Next question. Would you pick Veteran Engineer over the comparable black and white uncommon um, uh, Crydel? Or not Crydel. Uh, Barrowin? Yes. I would take Veteran Engineer over Barrowin. Veteran Engineer wins like 1.2% more uh, in the archetype and is strictly easier to cast. Like it's just... The you know the numbers say that like the toughness plus easier to cast matters more than the like payoff for attacking if you've completed a dungeon and I have no reason not to trust that. Let me walk that back a little bit. When I say I have no reason not to trust that, I mean overall I do trust that. I c- I could make the case that like oh you know maybe people are taking borrow in as a sign and forcing black white when they shouldn't otherwise or doing something to lead to a weaker overall deck than like the more versatile card. A a case could be made. My guess is that veteran engineer is stronger because of the toughness, but I'm not like very sure about that. And there are spots where it's like, okay, you know, like I have a few veteran engineers and I'm really good at completing dungeons. Uh, I I think that like Barrowin's going to be particularly good in my deck, especially if I have like, particularly good creatures to return or like a, some kind of like skull port merchant type engine or or if i'm just like really exceptional at completing dungeons so that i'm more likely to get the benefit there obviously you know like if we assume these cards are close enough that you know sometimes one's better than the other better and engineer is clearly better the less likely you are to have a completed dungeon whereas borrowing is relatively better the more likely you already have a completed dungeon so i would expect that if you're in the you know top x percentile of ability to complete dungeons you probably hit a point where borrowing is a stronger card it's complicated there's some kind of context by default early in the draft better and engineer is the stronger card but if you are very good at dungeons then you probably won't borrow it that, that's where I'm going to land on that. Next question. Also wanted to ask you about the one white target creature phases out if it's black exile it on arena specifically, where you expect to play against three to four red black decks in a seven X run. I personally, like I get where you're, where you're coming from. I personally am not really willing to put a card whose fail state is that bad into my deck. It just feels like the risk is too great. But it wouldn't shock me to learn that, like, that works out for people. But certainly in a spot where, like, I feel like I have an edge in general, I don't want to, like, open up, like, oh, I drew this card in the wrong matchup and I've just, like, created this, like, unnecessary vulnerability. Um, So I would avoid playing it. Next question. Do you like Cleric class in this archetype? There are some good synergies in black with Reaper's Talisman and Vampire Spawn. So my answer is... I don't think Cleric Class plus Vampire Spawn is very good, but I do think Cleric Class is very good with Steadfast Paladin and uh, Reaper's Talisman. So it really depends on exactly how much of that stuff I have. I, I've had decks where I have no interest in Cleric Class, and I've had decks where I play Cleric Class. And 
you do get some triggers and like player class is just kind of good by itself. Like the third stage is just so good. Um, like getting a creature back, getting life. And then because you got the creature, the life, you got to put a counter on something. That means that I'm a little bit more willing to risk it. If I have like a relatively small amount of repeated life gain. Um, I don't think it's like anywhere near as good as it is in green, white, when you're like really leaning into this. But I, I do think that, you know, it's a solid playable if you have some of the stuff. Next question. Is there a tipping point at which you start ignoring win rates and just draft things that say venture? So the idea here is the more stuff that you, the more like cloister gargoyles you have, the more all of your venture stuff is good because your venture stuff is good with your venture stuff and you're specifically getting paid off for completing a dungeon as fast as possible. All of it's becoming more desirable and then it's like, well, I don't know how much more desirable to make this, but it's probably just desirable enough that I should take it. So you end up like saying, you know, like I'm going to take Yonti Fangblade over Steadfast Paladin even though Steadfast Paladin wins more because I'm pretty sure that I'm just about like venturing. And I think you don't want to go just like full crazy, full crazy, like I'm going to take this Delver's Torch over Grim Bounty because Grim Bounty doesn't say venture and Delver's Torch does. I do think that like there's some truth to this idea that, you know, obviously the more stuff you have that rewards you for completing a dungeon in particular, the more you want to like increase the rate at which you're taking venture cards. But I, I don't think it, I don't, I wouldn't guess that it gets to the point where you should just like, you know, make sure that I'm taking a venture card no matter what. Like some tribal formats, you can get to a spo- uh, point where you're like, all right, well, like I have, you know, five different elves that really just want to count all my elves. So I'm going to take any elf over any non elf, especially like older tribal formats like Onslaught or something. And I don't think like the dungeon linear is strong enough to get you to that point where you're just like, yeah, my deck's way better if every single card says venture than if, you know, three quarters of my cards say venture. So no, but yes, like, no, not literally that, but yes, you're right that you can increase the amount that you uh, care about venture from here. Obviously, the corollary there is also true that we're looking at averages, and if sometimes you care about it more than this, also sometimes you care about it less than this. And it is possible to be in a white black deck where you have a relatively low amount of venture stuff and you just decide that you know speed running dungeons isn't part of what your deck does about dungeon map and rope i didn't look at their win rates specifically they were uh you know low enough that they win less often than average for the archetype um i have played them i don't dislike map in particular I think that it's playable, especially if you are like relatively deep on venture stuff, but it's not like a high priority. I, I think I'm going to uh, wrap it up there. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, wherever you are tra- tuning in. Just to remind everyone, I am recording this uh, live every week at 8 p.m. Pacific on Monday. And or not Monday, <laughs> sorry, 8 p.m. Pacific Wednesday. So if you would like to be here uh, for the live recording and ask questions, that would be the time to tune in. And for anyone else who's listening to this in one way and wants to listen to it some other way, uh, you can catch this on my Twitch channel, uh, twitch.tv slash Samuel H. Black, or our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Drafting Archetypes, or whatever podcast app you like. Um, I will be back next week with another archetype to be determined by vote of the patrons. So thanks everyone and bye for now. For light speed.